welcome everyone. It's wonderful to have you all on this webinar for My Medicine Australia. We're very relieved that we've got over 100 people because last webinar we paid for a license for a thousand, but um, there was an issue. So it's really great to see the numbers going up and up. Um, we've had over 560 people register for tonight's webinar, which is quite extraordinary. And you'd all be aware that we have another webinar, well, you may be aware we're having another webinar next Wednesday, um, which gives a bit more background on Mind Medicine yeah. Australia. And um, that should also be very exciting. But what we thought we'd do is, um, just to give you a framework for what's gonna happen tonight, is we're gonna go through a little bit of background on Mind Medicine Australia. Then I'm going to introduce Renee, Harvey and Alana Roy who will be taking you through the <laughs> professional development program that we have. If everyone could just make sure that their mics are muted, that would be excellent. David Roach, if you could make sure your mic is muted as well. Thank you. And um, so we'll be going through the professional development program. We'll talk a little bit about ways you can work with and help with and participate with Mind Medicine Australia. And then we'll have a Q&A. We've had a number of people who've submitted questions before this webinar. And we'll also be keeping an eye on the chat feed. We hope to finish on time, but we will also stay on screen for an extra 15 to 20 minutes for those of you who wish to just unmute your mics and have a bit of a conversation with us at the end. Okay, so Alan, if we could go to the presentation, that'd be fantastic. Is this where I sing for whole music? <laughs> Can you all see that? Yes. I believe so. So um, we wanted to start start off with really talking about why we set up Mind Medicine Australia. And as many of you would appreciate, our mental illness statistics are at really alarming levels. And with the current crisis, they're getting worse and worse. We're having an, an exponential rise in mental illness right now through this crisis as people are locked down, as they lose employment. Um, just that the pressure that everyone feels. So those statistics there, one in five Australian adults have a mental illness today or before this crisis actually. One in eight Australians are now on antidepressants including one in four older Australians. And over approximately one in two of us will have a serious mental illness in our lifetimes. And these numbers of course are increasing through this current crisis which is predicted to um, lead to far more illness and deaths than that, the actual COVID um, virus itself. Most common mental illnesses there, PTSD, other anxiety disorders, depression and substance abuse. We'll move on to the next slide. So My Medicine Australia is a registered charity founded by Peter. Hello everybody. Oh, no, that was just your hand. That's my hand. Oh, <laughs> That's Peter, Peter and I, Peter's my husband. And um, we, we have DGR1 charity status. And our goal is to seek to broaden the pre treatment paradigm available to medical practitioners and their patients, to establish safe, accessible and effective psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in Australia to treat a range of mental illnesses. At the moment, our focus is on medicinal psilocybin and MDMA, but over time that could increase to other medicines. Our goal, I guess, is that these therapies become an integral part of the mental health system so that if you go to a medical practitioner, not only will they talk about antidepressants and psychotherapy, but they'll say another option for you is psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And they'll give you the full disclosure on the benefits and drawbacks of each kind of treatment. Our goal as well is that these medicines are accessible and affordable to all Australians in need and regardless of geography as well. Next slide. So unfortunately at the moment, as many of you would appreciate, and based on the statistics that we showed you at the beginning, 
the treatment options remain really inadequate. There's been no innovation in treatments for nearly 50 years. And in the case of depression, only 35% of sufferers experience some remission from current antidepressants or psychotherapy. Uh, many people relapse after treatment stops. And of course, these medicines carry multiple side effects for a lot of people. This is not to say that some people don't get better through these medicines, but not enough people get better. And with PTSD, uh, the response rate to pharmacotherapy and other treatments is even lower. And as all of you, most of you who are therapists out there would appreciate is much harder to treat. So a more of the same approach is not gonna solve the problem that we have and the growing crisis that we have. Next slide. So our focus, as we mentioned before, is medicinal psilocybin for depression and potentially obsessive compulsive disorder and addiction and medicinal MDMA for PTSD and also treatment of addiction. As many of you would appreciate now, uh, these medicines are also being trialled for a range of other conditions, including eating disorders and dementia. The remarkable thing about these medicines is that only two to three dose session is required compared to a lifetime of potential antidepressants and or weekly psychotherapy. These sessions are scaffolded by psychotherapy and Alana will, and Renee will talk further about this uh, during this session. The medicines are considered very safe in a medically controlled environment and they're non-addictive. And both have been granted breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA in the USA, which means that the FDA is actually um, fast tracking, helping to fast track the approval process because these medicines are considered to be so prospective and so much better than existing treatments. And just to give you a sense of that, these medicines in 119 current or recent trials are showing an average remission rate, and that is remission, not just reaction, but remission rate of 60 to 80%. Next slide. So we're focusing on four, four key strategic areas with Mind Medicine Australia, awareness and knowledge building. And tonight is, and our webinar series is part of that. Improving um, awareness about these medicines, um, educating people, holding regular events, screenings, et cetera, once we get back allowed out of our houses. Hosting our major global international summit in November this year with some of the leading thinkers and psychiatrists and scientists in the world. We also have state and regional chapters being set up, which some of you are, are involved in. And then tonight, of course, we'll be talking about the Therapist Professional Development Program. That's what Renee and Alana will be talking to you about. And I'm not gonna go into more detail about that because I'll let them do that for you. We're also planning to set up an Asia Pacific Center of Excellence based in Australia to increase the treatment um, options, applied research and development, looking at supply chains for the medicines, and also looking at rollout of clinics. The other thing that Mind Medicine Australia is focused on is the preferred legal and ethical frameworks, the medicine sourcing, as we mentioned before, and how we might look at getting the medicines rescheduled um, and providing, oh, Ilan, that was a funny sound and additional um, ethical frameworks. So now I'm going to move on to introduce, uh, Alan, could we go to the next slide and, uh, and we'll introduce Renee. So I think Renee, you're gonna start. So I wanna welcome Renee. We have brought Renee from London to live in Australia. And I'm sure she's much happier to be here now <laughs> here than she is back in London. And um, Renee, we're very fortunate to work with Renee because she has worked with the psilocybin trials at Imperial College, which are the leading psilocybin trials in the world with Robin Carhart Harris and Professor David Nutt and others. So over to you, Renee. Right, hi, can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great, uh, it's very nice to be here and I'm pleased to be able to talk about um, the plans that we have, very exciting plans. 
And Elan, just at the minute, I'm um, not seeing. Okay, right, got them. So just to add on to what uh, you can just share your screen with us, Renee. I'm sharing. Must I share the screen? Yes. Okay. So it's the green arrow down the bottom. Elan, you might have to do it. Okay. There we go. Beautiful. Okay. okay. Right. So um, to, to build on to what uh, Tanya was saying, the, uh, the skills development program really will be a chance for us to help establish some standards for safe and ethical practice. And what we want to do with this is to bring together medical approaches, good psychotherapy, good standards, and also, interestingly, uh, bring in transpersonal aspects and the spiritual sort of mystical experiences that people tell us and they often have when they take these substances and which has been recognized in research as a key factor in promoting long-term benefit. People come back and say that it's been life-changing and um, they remember it for years. So um, we want to make sure that that's built into the process. Also, we want to further knowledge and interest in, and in the change and the healing process, just expand our knowledge about it, provide training, support, education, and networking for the professionals already involved. And that is really what Alana will talk about a bit later. Um, uh, now it's not going down. Um, Elon, can you scroll down? I'll just share my screen. I'll go back to how it was. We practiced this. Here we go. <laughs> Renee? Yes? Are you speaking? Okay. So um, how are we going to do this? Well, and the first point we started at was learning from the pioneers, the leaders in the field. Uh, many people will know that MAPS has been doing work for years uh, in the States on uh, research trials in using MDMA for PTSD. And they have put together a wonderful training course for people that work with them. The California Institute of Integral Studies has been leading the world in the first dedicated uh, program. And then others like uh, USONA and New York Imperial College. And so we've um, taken the best of what they've done, particularly following what the CIAS is doing. Um, we are uh, consulting with people. We're making use of their teaching expertise. And of course, um, as um, Tanya said, I've come along to help put this together. I've had my training at Imperial, and it's very exciting to be able to do this. We're, um, all of this is being watched very closely by a steering committee led by Professor David Castle, Professor Greg Murray, Shauna Carroll, and Alana is part of that too. We meet regularly and just make sure the whole thing is moving ahead smoothly. So what does a psychedelic therapist need to know? Um, sometimes you see pictures like this. This is from a real session at Johns Hopkins University. And people say, well, what do they do besides sitting next to people and, and being very kind to them? Well, actually, there's a lot to it. And it can uh, be quite deceptively simple. So what we're doing is we're taking the learning from the California Institute of um, Integral Studies and a wonderful paper that Professor Janice Phelps, who's the lead there, wrote, where she identified 12 domains of training, 12 aspects that are important to, to include in a training course. First of all, we look at the history of clinical research. We cover the current legal status of therapy, what's happening in the world. Um, there's a component on neurobiology, neuropharmacology, drug dispositions, what they do, the interactions. Then we look at the actual set um, sessions themselves. And there's a process and it's recognized uh, everywhere to do with the right set, the right setting, where you prepare the person, you get the right atmosphere for them in a session, and then afterwards they go through an integration process. And it's really important to have a look at the role of the therapists and in the work that therapists do before and afterwards, the dynamics that um, trained uh, therapists will know about um, all happen there and need to be uh, made, you know, we need to be aware of them and work with them. And the training also has a lot of supervised observation of psychedelic sessions. So 
Um, we, we look at real sessions, we do role plays and um, do a lot of practicing of skills. So the course is not just about giving people intellectual knowledge, it really is hands-on. It's about getting those therapists to increase and, and to develop their skills. Um, there's a, there are variations in therapeutic modes that are built into the models, um, such as client-centered and um, psycholytic, psychedelic therapy. Complementary therapy techniques are also important to know about. Co-therapy methods, interprofessional skills for working in multidisciplinary teams. The graduates from the course will go on to, on to work in, in different settings, and so it's important to address how things work in those different settings. Um, the course will also cover current models of consciousness, looking at spiritual intent, uh, intelligence and mystical experiences. We will, of course, also be looking at what's been happening for centuries, we know of, the ceremonial use of psychedelics in religious and community settings. Um, we also are uh, aiming in future to incorporate the next two points. These are a key part of what happens in California. For us, this is something we will develop into, and that is where people actually have placements in real settings to uh, take their learning a step further. And then what uh, they brought into the MAPS course is personal experience of being guided as a research participant, taking MDMA in, in the setting and experiencing what it's like. We, we know we're near getting to that point yet, but that's something to strive for in the future when it, when it becomes possible. So in addition to those, those uh, competencies, there are also those domains, sorry, there are these six competencies that cut across all of the other domains and that we need to be uh, very clear mm -hmm. on developing. The one is the capacity for the person to have an empathic abiding presence. And that's something about holding themselves together in evenly suspended attention, being mindful, being empathic, being able to listen, the doing by not doing, and knowing how to remain calm, respond to the person's distress and mm -hmm. hold them very, very calmly. And um, second thing is trust enhancement, developing people's capacity to trust. Thirdly, uh, our trainees need to think about spiritual intelligence and have a lot of this. So there has to be a capacity to work with this and having a personal basis of understanding for this. There needs to be a very solid knowledge of the psychedelics themselves. Therapists need to have a lot of self-awareness, a lot of ethical integrity, and they need to know about quite a broad range of, of uh, techniques of therapy, including complementary techniques, such as working with the body in various ways, which is often not included in mainstream training. So um, the certificate that we're putting together is based very largely on CIS. Um, the, some of the differences are that we've shortened it because we're listening to feedback from Australian audiences. They want it to be a little bit shorter but we will be including all of those components except the last two, as um, I mentioned. So for the future, our graduates are going to be very well positioned to participate in Australian research and will be able to have access through our psychological services to appropriate supervision. As I say, in the future, we'll try and see what, what we can do about people having experience, having an experience. But for now, we just want Beautiful, to be very, very clear that um, Mind Medicine Australia is focused specifically on the clinical application of medicinal psilocybin and MDMA for mental illness. We do not advocate for non-clinical use of psychedelics or any other prohibited substances, and for any we don't advocate for any changes in the law in respect to non-clinical use. So our focus is completely clinical. So what the course will consist of is a, um, it will happen over a period of four months. There'll be 90 hours of live or webinar-based tuition with practical instruction, as I said, a focus on real skills. There will also be a lot of additional reading and self-study that we expect from participants. People will be guided through this. It will be... Sorry, Renee, could you just hold on for one moment? We just need to make sure the mics are all muted. Ilan, we need all mics muted. Ilan? Yes, hold on. You can mute all mics, so please. There is a lot of noise coming through. If somebody's yeah. not muted, I'm just going to mute. 
you, you are able to, as the admin, mute all mics. There we go. So now we've got to unmute Renee. Yeah, anybody there else? There you go. Renee, you'll need to go back to where I interrupted if you don't mind. Oh, there we are. I'll start again with the slides. So our course will take place over three to four months and um, it's going to incorporate 90 hours of live or webinar-based tuition with practical instruction. Um, so as I've said, the focus is very much about the practical side of it. There'll be a lot of additional reading, self-study, and we will give people a pre-course reading schedule. Um, as soon as they enroll, they'll get uh, guidance on what to start reading. Then the heart of the course really are these intensives. So what we're going to ask people to do is for a weekend, they come to Melbourne, where we go through all of the basic learnings. We, we create the basic platform on which to build all the skills. And it's going to be about becoming aware of their own practice and how they're going to be using um, the medicines themselves in future working with people. Then there'll be a weekend of holotropic breathwork. And this really is the closest we will come for people to have a live experience of being able to get into some kind of an altered state of consciousness and experience working with other people and feeling care, take, being taken care of and taking care of other people comes pretty close to uh, a, a real session. Uh, and then um, towards the end of the course, one full week intensive where people will come along, will go away, will stay somewhere together, and everyone will have a chance to do some practice with role plays, observing other people, learning from each other, and getting um, real hands-on learning with what you do in the situation. We look at challenges, we look at risks, we look at when things don't go so smoothly, and, uh, and then we'll start working on integration and helping people put it all back together again. So in the interim weeks, there'll be uh, the reading and weeks, there'll be the webinars, about a three hour long one in the middle week between each of these weekends. And then finally, we will ask people to do a written task and we will uh, do some evaluating of the person's learning and uh, we want to be satisfied that when you go away, you feel confident and you, you know what you're doing. You've learned something that you didn't know before. So this is what we're going to look at. So for the therapist, using their own insight and experience in um, the left-hand side of the slide. So it's using your insight. It's using knowledge. It's using emotions. It's attention to the body. And it's knowing what to do. So the, the five domains of... Um, how you function in therapy with somebody else. Those all come together, supporting the person taking the psychedelics, um, helping them feel safe and open so that they then integrate their own spiritual experiences, then integrate this within themselves, in their understanding, in emotions, and then actually make real changes to behavior, to carry the learning over into their lives and make change. And I think this is where the real difference comes with this therapy. Sorry, Renee, just to interrupt again. Ilan, we need the screen as full slide. It's cut off. You're not using full screen. Right. Share. I'll share my screen rather. Yes. And have you unmuted um, other people again, or uh, are they all on mute, Ilan? Everybody was unmuted, unless somebody has now manually unmuted themselves. Okay. That's not full screen, is it? Share screen. Right. Thank you. Okay, so... Um, do you want me to go over the slide again? Or no, no, I... that's fine. Keep, keep going, because we need to move on because we want to get to the Q&A. All right. Um, Elaine, will you move us to the next one now? 
Right, so eligibility, we've had lots of people ask us about this. And, and here it is, folks. So what we, what we want you to do is with a course like this, we have to start with people that um, are already at some kind of a baseline level of knowledge with, um, their, uh, with um, their ability to understand what the therapeutic process is. And so we want people that are already at the level of having a bachelor's degree in a field relevant to mental health, as well as at least three years of documented supervised practice in a mental health field. And there will also be an interview selection process. Those three things together. So on this basis, as um, baseline qualification, this is what the list of what we're looking for. Counseling and clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, medical practitioners, occupational therapists, social workers, mental health nurses, registered psychotherapists and counselors. This covers quite a broad field. And um, if you do have mental health experience with, uh, if, you can, uh, if you can conform to those middle three criteria and you want to speak to us about um, what you can offer, then you're welcome to do this as well. Okay. And uh, here are the planned dates. So we'll run two courses next year, starting, first one starting on 30th of January, second one on 26th of June. And because we've had so many inquiries, we're actually going to open the applications formally quite early this year, 1st of June. And we'll close them on 31st of August, unless it's sold out prior to that date. We'll start the screening and the interviews and finalize the applicants by September 2020. So there we are. We're also going to have all the links and all the information on our website, all the detailed course information, all the stuff that I've said so far will be for there for you um, in due course. And you have the cost there as well. So at this stage, I'm happy to hand over to Alana. Hi, everyone. It's uh, so exciting to be here. Thank you um, for connecting during such strong times. Um, individually and globally, we're going through so much. We need to stay strong as a community and get this work, work done. So I'm excited to tell you about the psychological support services that we have recently launched over the last couple of weeks. And um, Renee and I are the practice managers and the psychologists that are going to the that are running a, and building a national team of allied health professionals and psychotherapists. So our goal is to ensure that the Australian community has access to highly qualified professionals so that people can make informed choices about their mental health in regards to psychedelics and plant medicines. And we wanna create a really strong and skilled and supported community, the medicine community to do this work. The services that we're offering are individual counselling via Zoom, um, in clinics, in people's private practices, and uh, group integration. You know, of course, at the moment with COVID, this is all happening remotely, but it will be um, in face-to-face -face services when we return to normal. We are providing peer supervision around Australia and, and connecting with professionals just like you to make those connections and to strengthen mm -hmm. our knowledge together and also including those people, not just in allied health and psychotherapists, but people doing alternative and holistic healing and therapy in this space, because uh, we are all in this together and um, we want to work with you. We offer professional consultations and uh, social work placements. So, um, which is really exciting to have social workers and universities on board. This is our wonderful team so far. So we have, we have me, I'm the practice manager, the psych uh, psychologist and social worker, Renee Harvey, as you know now. Robbie Moore is a psychotherapist um, based in, in Sydney and Do Dr. Yuri Shamus, who's in Melbourne. Please contact us. Um, there's information on the bottom of the screen. If you are a, a therapist and have skills yeah. and are interested in working with us, we will be building our team um, nationally. Yeah. And as the demand increases, we want to bring more wonderful people who have the life experience, uh, the integrity and um, yeah, the, the expertise to do this work. So please make contact with me. The referral pathways we have, um, this depends on each individual practitioner who works with us. So for example, I'm registered with NDIS, private health, 
you can bulk bill. Um, and we also have psychotherapists that charge their own rates. So we are now able to offer Australians who are working with the medicine um, and want integration support, a whole range of referral pathways and even bulk billing, which is fantastic. We have set up this team to, to go national and to offer people integration support. And as you can see, and as you know, the, the realms of integration and self-care are complex and traditional mainstream mental health services are not equipped to deal with the work that we are, that we are in. So as, as there's, a, there's a quote that says, after, the, after enlightenment become, comes the laundry. And you may, although you may receive 10 years of insights in one session, these insights require integration, personal responsibility, and action to get the most out of our experiences. So our team is here to support people with their mental health and help them to get the most out of their transformative uh, medicine experiences. So these are, these are a range of areas our clinicians are, and therapists are skilled in. So harm minimization, safety and self-care, risk assessments, helping people to, to see if they are in a safe place to be able to consider working with medicines from a risk point of view. Um, we offer practical advice on how to balance having mystical and transformative experiences and then getting back to the laundry, getting back to the everyday and, and being able to work in those multiple spaces. We offer a safe place for spiritual crisis, spiritual emergence, um, for people navigating suicidal thoughts and frightening experiences without the fear of, you know, diagnosis and um, working together to avoid further traumatic experiences through the mental health system. And we're trained to support people to, to help process fear of death, existential anxiety, unpack our cultural conditioning, our beliefs and our norms. And we offer, you know, a unique service that... Um, oh, you're moving quick. <laughs> Um, and these are, the, these are the therapies and modalities we are trained in, integration, transpersonal psychology, CBT, mindfulness, emotion-focused therapy, Jungian, shadow work, archetypal work, and EMDR, um, particularly for, tra for trauma and, and traumatic um, experiences. Next slide. So we are running, Renee and I are running Zoom groups at the moment um, and face-to-face -face services when things change uh, with groups of six. It's only costing $35. We want it to be accessible. We want, we want to connect and, and get you on board. We have peer supervision for allied health professionals and psychotherapists, group in integration for people who are working with the medicine and wanting to explore those um, experiences with, you know, in a supportive and professional environment. And also another space that we're creating is for holistic and alternative practitioners that might not be uh, working in the medical model, but still want to connect with us and um, are supportive of Mind Medicine. So please register your interest with, with us and make contact and we will see you in Zoom to build this strong, skilled community. Next slide. Yeah, that was... I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Tanya, are you taking over that slide? Um, yes, I will. Um, so thank you, Renee, and thank you, Alana, and, and we'll be back with you in a moment to, uh, for questions. And we've seen lots and lots of questions on the feed as well. So um, I've been keeping a, a tab of those as well. Lots of people ask um, how they can help get the word out there about Mind Medicine Australia and about these medicines so that people properly understand the medicines and the science behind the medicines and why they're so effective and to help remove the stigma that unfortunately is still attached to these medicines in some, in some areas. So key ways that all of you can help is start conversations, share this information. We have lots of wonderful volunteers who work with Mind Medicine Australia and we welcome you to work in our offices or to set up chapters in your local areas. Um, read our educational content. We have a wonderful learn section on our website. Talk to other doctors and medical professionals about these medicines and start um, really 
helping them to get up the curve and to understand these medicines. Help us to fundraise and donate. Um, you don't have to be big donors, but lots of people are regular donors and we welcome that. And of course, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the generous support of a number of philanthropists. So that's what's allowing this organisation to really lead the field in this, in this Asia Pacific region. Follow us on social media, share our um, you know, posts, uh, talk to your local members of parliament, attend our educational events, screenings, a global summit in November, which we'll show you a bit about in a moment as well. So there's some of the ways. And this is our summit in November. Um, so at this stage, this is going ahead. We've sold um, over 300 tickets so far. Um, there's a two day um, introductory workshop to psychedelic therapies, which I think a number of you would be registered for. And we welcome you to register for that if you haven't already. We've sold a lot of tickets for that. And then the two day summit with some of the leading thinkers and speakers um, in this space in the world, including Rick Doblin, you know, Robin Carhart Harris, David Nutt, and others. And we welcome you to join us for that. At this stage, um, we're praying that this can go ahead. We believe it will be able to you because November is quite a, a while away, but if it, if it can't go ahead in November, then it will be early 2021. But at this stage, we're all got our fingers and toes crossed for November and encourage you to register because it will sell out. And now I think what we'll do is go through to, uh, ah, also our next webinars, yes. So the next webinars are next Wednesday, uh, April 29th at 5.30, the way forward to making these medicines available and accessible to all Australians. So talking more about some of the strategy and steps and also um, more of the background to these medicines and how they work and the science behind them. Then on May the 6th at 7.30, um, Psychedelic Assisted Psychotherapy for PTSD, that's by psychiatrist, Dr. Nigel Strauss. On May the 12th, Anxiety and Optimism, the Paths Out of COVID and Beyond, um, with uh, Mark Cross, a psychiatrist who's a specialist in anxiety, and Victor Purton, who speaks a lot about optimism. And then on May the 20th, with Dr. Nigel Strauss, again, about psychiatry and psychedelics. Uh, so we'll now move into the questions, I think. Yes, we'll just get everyone back on screen so that we can see everyone. Okay, sweep his view, excellent. So we'll go now to the first question. Um, that we've been asked, which is how does the RANZCP, Australian College of Psychiatrists, currently view mind medicine, Australians support this building for these therapies overseas and in Australia? Does the RANZCP need to support these therapies because that before they can be approved for clinical use in Australia? And I'm going to let Peter just um, answer that question. Yep. Okay. We, we put a lot of uh, uh, time and effort into uh, developing relationships with psychiatrists. They're obviously central to this whole process. Uh, they're the most senior uh, physicians in Australia in terms of mental illness. Uh, we're expecting a position paper to come out from the Royal College fairly soon. And uh, that will lay out uh, a lot of information about uh, uh, these medicines. We've also got a number of the leading people who've been involved with the Royal College on our advisory panel now. So uh, it, it's a journey and it's a journey of uh, in providing information and understanding and getting psychiatrists to realize that actually this is a breakthrough for, the, for them, which is what psychiatrists realized back in the 50s and 60s. And then we had this 50 year hiatus period. So yes, psychiatrists are extraordinarily important in this process. And there's not a week that, that goes by that we don't get more psychiatrists coming onto our advisory panel. That's right. And um, the RANZCP has actually been quite supportive in helping to spread the global summit as well. So moving on now to the next question. Um, 
considering all the clinical trials taking place over the past several years in the USA and the UK, can this be useful for Australia? Do we have to reinvent the wheel and wait for years before we're able to use this proved method of treatment? <laughs> Peter, do you want to answer that? Yeah, um, that, that's a really important question because if we wait for all these trials to finish, we're, get, we're going to be waiting some time. I mean, even with the breakthrough therapy designation in America, that will take time you know, as they go through the phase three trials, for both MDMA and uh, psilocybin. There is though another route in Australia, which is the route that's been used for uh, medicinal cannabis, and that's a special access scheme. And, that is, and that's where uh, you apply on a case by case basis for approval to the TGA. Uh, the TGA has said publicly, publicly that it uh, should be available for uh, psychedelic medicine. And we've done a lot of work proformering the application for special access approval, so that from a psychiatrist's perspective, putting in an application will be really easy because all they have to do is the patient information. Uh, so you know, we're hopeful that will start this year. And if you recall, when medicinal cannabis started through that scheme, it was really clunky and it was very slow. Uh, but then it speeded up and now uh, you get two day approvals, approvals online within two days, and there are 4,000 approvals going through every month. So uh, we could see real momentum with this as, as it starts to uh, get accepted by more and more psychiatrists. In the early days, it will be the psychiatrists making the applications for approval to use the therapy and then bringing in the therapist to obviously do the work. Um. The next question, um, I might also just mention just in terms of when registrations will be um, opening for the course, because we have a we have a well over 250 therapists and clinicians who've um, asked to be put on a wait list for when we actually open the course registrations. And our goal is to open the course registrations on June the 1st. So it's going to be very, very important um, to be to get in quickly uh, because there's a, just enormous demand. We're going to run, I think, is it Renee, two intakes in 2021? That's right. Yes, two intakes. Yeah, no and ha and a maximum of 50 per intake. Yes, probably 40 between 40 and 50. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's really important for people to keep their eyes out. We will put an EDM out, an announcement out as soon as we do open the registration and we expect them to go very quickly. Um, okay, we'll move to the next question now, which is um, for you, Renee, given that FDA approval of MDMA limits the prescribing of MDMA to psychiatrists who have completed the MAPS trained course, what organisation does MMA propose to be the accredited TGA equivalent and would healthcare professionals who've already completed the MAPS accredited training be exempt? Um, would there be some sort of reciprocal approval, etc.? Right, but what I can say is I think the training that we're putting on as MAP is built more along the lines of the CIIS course, which uh, incorporates a lot of what MAPS does but goes a little bit further. Now, uh, MAPS, um, MAPS's training is focused very specifically on using MDMA uh, for PTSD, although they cover quite a lot of topics. But I, I think um, that our course is uh, probably, I think if, you, if a person did the MAPS course, they could probably still get quite a lot of uh, good uh, additional information out of our course. And uh, I think part of the question was also about the accreditation. We are working on this at the moment, and what we're looking at is a certification endorsement of some kind from CIAS, and then we work on our own um, accreditation pathway in Australia in addition to that. So we're hoping to come out of this with a, a world-class course that's in, on the same level as the CIS and uh, MAPS course. And um, I just also wanted to mention that if there are any MAPS trained therapists out there, if they could reach out to us at Mind Medicine Australia, we'd really like to hear from you um, and start to see how we can also include you in some of our programs. So if, if you're out there, please reach out to us. The next question is, um, I'm a social worker with some years of work ahead of me before I qualify to train as a psychedelic assisted therapist, but I have the goal in my sights. 
My questions relates to the many skilled yet underground shamans, therapists and facilitators that presently practice outside of the law. As I understand it, to qualify to be a practitioner, one must be an allied health professional, primary, primarily revolving around the mainstream allopathic medical model, model. Yet this could be argued to limit the potential streams of local best practices that could inform and direct the future of this work. Question is, are there any plans um, for willing and effective underground practitioners to be included and embrace them with this framework without them having formal mainstream qualifications? If not, could some kind of peak body be created? That's a great idea. To gauge experience levels, set ethical standards and practice frameworks for freelance uh, for freelancers to, to adhere to. So that's gonna be answered by you, Alana. <laughs> The, the reality is to make these medicines legal in, in, our, in our current culture and context in Australia, it needs to be through clinical research setting in hospitals. And our, our training um, will, be, will be, although it's including, it's including transpersonal elements like psychology, we are working with multidisciplinary medical professionals. And... Our, our, our baseline is to have um, very skilled practitioners who are allied health and, and psychotherapists. Um, it is possible down the track to potentially involve other community members, but our sole focus at the moment is, is the legal pathway because there's a mental health crisis. Um, but we, we want to keep connected with, with everyone, multiple perspectives, those working in the community, in all the different forms, but the, the way forward to address this mental health crisis is by working within those frameworks. And that's not to say that we don't appreciate that there's some wonderful underground therapists out, out there and that we have enormous respect for. And that's why we've created that, that, that Zoom space and, and when COVID finishes, the face-to-face -face space to connect with everyone. And yeah. Yeah, the, 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 these medicines have been used for thousands and thousands of years, but in Australia, we need to go through this pathway to make them legal. Thank you, Alana, that's wonderful. Another question here is, uh, this is for you, Renee, I think, do you think it matters whether you train as a psychiatrist or GP to be able to work with psychedelics in the future? Do you think both will be able to prescribe and train in psychedelic psychotherapy? I'm about to return to my psychiatry training, but I'm debating whether to switch to GP. Well, I think they should be a psychiatrist, right? <laughs> Renee? Well, yes, I think in either case, uh, it's not going to work the same way as it does with prescribing other psychotropic medications. So we're never going to work with these medicines the way you do with, say, an antidepressant, where you prescribe and you send the person off um, home with it. So there will always be the need to have uh, co-working and keep that this was in a setting. And those skills really require a, a solid knowledge of psychotherapy and the psychotherapeutic um, principles. So I would say that uh, if you were going to do, do the psychiatry or GP route, you also need to know what uh, psychotherapy is about. And uh, according to our criteria, it's important to have some of those skills on board and, um, uh, and look at how you can train yourself further in, the, in that sort of field. Um, so, yes, I, I would say of the two, possibly psychiatry is going to give you that more than GP training would. Thank you. And um, look, I'm just going to pick one of the questions off, this, off the feed just for a moment. So the question here is, is um, MMA primarily concerned with the delivery of these medicines or also with research regarding the underlying mechanisms? The answer to that one is that we're concerned with both. Um, so we're interested in novel trials uh, in Australia, but we don't really want to replicate what's gone on overseas. And that's why we're setting up a centre of excellence in Australia um, for the Asia Pacific. But of course, we're most committed to making sure that these medicines become available and accessible to all of those who are suffering as soon as possible. Uh, the next question here that I've got is, um, how would you advise someone who is interested in starting their career in this field? Um, what opportunities are there here in Australia as we continue to work towards legislation? Alana, I, I'd love you to, um, this, this person has a public health background, so they're not psychic, psych clinical yet, but 
I'm sure this is a great question for, for lots of people on the call. Yeah, I guess there's two parts to this question in this field. This field is very broad, but if we're talking about therapy, um, I guess the fastest route is, is you know, to be registered as an allied health professional, whether that's a psychologist, a mental health social worker, mental health nurse, um, psychotherapist, and to have you know ex extensive experience with counselling and transformative experiences. But this, as I said, this field is very broad. So there's a whole range of areas, research, advocacy, policy, um, social media, events, integration support. Um, so there is space for everyone. Um, but in regards to therapy, I, I guess if you're wanting to join our training and be part of this, it's really skilling up in, in those allied health areas. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw a really funny question. Is a degree in law considered a mental health field? Well, that's a great question. I love that one. <laughs> you experience a lot of mental health. <laughs> and there's, um, there's also a question on, on the feed here from Andrew Kettle that's asking, is there a research group within MMA? I'm a research scientist, chemist, um, interested in conducting research, being part of a research group. Absolutely, we welcome any researchers who are on the call to approach us with their research proposals um, and we'll certainly look at them. We love chemists. And we love chemists. <laughs> I, I work across Deakin, Melbourne Uni and Victoria University. So uh, well, please contact all of us, obviously, but um, please contact me as well because we can um, start. Uh, the next one is, oh, sorry, Alana. Um, the next one is, um, what would you say are the main differences between current clinical approaches to mental health treatment in Australia and psychedelic therapy? Um, Renee, I'll, I'll get you to answer that question, please. Yes, um, when I read this question, I thought, well, goodness me, I could talk for a whole day on this. It's a very <laughs> <laughs> So um, I think what I can say is that um, psychedelic therapy really has got a, a very much broader focus um, and it's a bit more inclusive of uh, elements of other approaches. And an example of this is the body work approaches. I know certainly when I trained, we didn't do anything like that. So there's something about uh, bringing those kinds of ways of thinking, and of course the transpersonal side as well, that uh, these may not be part of a, a normal mainstream course. Um, so what, because what we need eventually is um, almost it's a level of integration that happens with the therapists as well. So we need someone that's got that basic traditional knowledge, but a lot of flexibility and understanding about some of these other approaches, and then a kind of loosening up of the standards. Somebody, some people say, you almost have to forget some of the, the way, ways in which you were trained before and loosen up your practice a lot more. And it does, it does mean it requires a lot of involvement from you. You know, you can't be as aloof and distant as uh, maybe uh, you might have been. Uh, not that everybody is, but yes. So there are differences, but still a lot of overlap. Um, just another question on the feed here. Do we have any psychologists from our organisation studies trials in Perth? Um, we are developing a new chapter in Perth at the moment. And of course, any of you out there that are interested in either setting up a chapter in an area where we don't have one or joining our existing chapters, please let us know. Because we do have a mix of both philanthropists, therapists, business people, scientists, researchers and others in our chapters. And we will certainly um, aim to connect with people in Perth and all over the country as much as we possibly can. Um, now, the next question, there's so many questions on the right <laughs> that it's hard for me to keep up with them all, but I'm just trying to answer the ones that have been. This one's for you, Renee. Um, thank you, Renee, for your work. You're a renowned psychedelic therapist. There you go. Um, and he's also saying renowned psychedelic therapist, Francoise Bouza, believes that the patient journey can only go as deep as the guide has been. Do you agree with this? Do you feel this places undue pressure on psychedelic therapists' own exploration of self? Great question. It's a, it is a great question. And um, I think broadly speaking, I would say absolutely right. You know, you have to have done some work on yourself. And, uh, you know, it, I, not, I think that I would agree with um, a lot of the other leaders in the field who say that if you come into this work, you, it's, it's good to have had that experience yourself. 
I wouldn't say that this is an excluding factor. If somebody came along and they hadn't actually had an experience, I wouldn't say that precludes them from joining a course, but they will need to have had some um, therapy on themselves. They need to have done some work. They need to have some kind of an understanding of those other dimensions of the work because it, it is very deep and it can be very deep. And I think you need to be prepared to go there with the people that you work with. Thank you. Um, the next question, hang on one sec, is, what do we see? Ah, um, Renee, I think this one's a, a wonderful one for you. Um, what integration practices do you recommend after a psychedelic therapy session? Okay, I think that, uh, well, one thing a person can do is join a, uh, an integration group. Uh, we are going to be running one uh, ourselves, but there are other groups around. It's an opportunity to go along and meet with other people who've had the experiences and just talk it through. The best thing is to actually be to share your experiences with people who are going to understand and not judge you. Um, the other thing is to do some individual work with a the therapist who also understands the process and won't judge you and can take you there. It's the talking through. It's the, it's the working with it. Um, I also think that if you absolutely can't attend a group and you can't see, get a therapist, work on your own. Do a little bit of processing work, like keep it, you know, do some journaling um, and do some guided Im imagery on your own. Um, but I think it is important not to just brush it aside for, and forget it. Uh, you, you come back with treasures from these journeys, and I think uh, it's, it's a good thing to try and work, as difficult as they may be, to work with them and try and make sense of them. Just um, a couple of the other questions that I'm picking up from the right hand side again is, is there a place to keep up with all the news and events? Well, certainly in terms of news, we constantly update news from around the world um, on our website. So that's a great place to keep up with news. And we have a lot of events. And of course, there's other events through the Australian Psychedelic Society and so on as well. We're also being asked about um, are these medicines going to be able to treat schizophrenia, ADHD, and so on? Um, Professor Castle believes that over time, as more research takes place, um, that there is every possibility that these medicines will be able to treat a range of other conditions as well. So that's something to look forward to in the future. Um, last couple of questions. Um, Okay, there's a question here is whether it's legally possible to work with psychedelic substances for therapeutic purposes in Australia, and if so, how? Um, Peter's going to answer that question. I'm very interested in doing so, but concerned about the legal ramifications <laughs> and also whether it could affect professional registration. So Peter's just going to answer that one. Yeah, I mean, the only way you can uh, experience psychedelics at the moment legally in Australia is through one of the trials. And at the moment, there is only one trial taking place, which is at St. Vincent's. And you've got to be, uh, you've got to be an, old, an old person who's got terminal Ill illness. So you probably don't want to be, be in that, uh, that category. Over time, there will be more trials, but that's always going to be a, quite a, 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 a narrow group of people doing the trials. Um, the second way will obviously be uh, as in when we get uh, uh, applications under Special Access Scheme B working, which will hopefully be later this year. Somebody who's got the, the appropriate mental illness and who uh, is working with a psychiatrist that's comfortable with these medicines could apply for access to the medicines. If on the other hand, you just want to experience uh, the psychedelic uh, medicine, unfortunately at the moment, that's not legal in Australia. And uh, under our constitution, we, 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 we're, we're prevented from uh, encouraging that in any way and indeed that's that's uh, one of the conditions of our charitable status that we don't in any way encourage the recreational taking of, uh, of psychedelics but you can go overseas and we do have a list of um, legal i think alana you have a list of legal centers and retreats that you can go and you can actually experience in, in very guided with wonderful guides um, these medicines in, in legal environments and we can make those resources available, which is how we did it. Which is how we did it. That's how we, why we have Mind Medicine Australia, because <laughs> Peter and I were, were so impacted by the experience that we felt that these medicines should be available to, to everyone. Um, I think, just let me see if there's any other last questions.
Um, Brian, I might just um, ask you to answer this question on this, on what's our current understanding of the link between psychosis and psychedelics. Um, today, psychosis is considered an exclusion criteria. However, is there evidence to suggest that psychosis could be treated using psychedelics? Um, well, yeah, in the early days, you know, in the, the 60s and 70s, before it was all banned and shut down, um, lots and lots of work went on with, with all kinds of um, people working in the field and being treated. So there wasn't a question earlier about um, autism. They, they uh, definitely worked with people with psychosis and had really good results, personality disorder and all that sort of thing. But of course, they had a very different setup in those years. And one of the ways I know that Stan Groff worked was he had a clinic. So people were able to be kept as inpatients and kept safe. So I think one of the challenges for us today is that um, it's very risky and very, um, um, I, don't, I don't think it's even ethical to work with somebody who um, you, you're going to work with them and then send them home. And you just don't know what they're going to struggle with and what they're going to go through. So I think that's the only reason we're saying that we, we exclude people for now. The trials are trying to look at very specific uh, groups of people. So from, from that point of view, there's a very strict exclusion of people with any kind of history like that. But, um, you know, I think in the future, hopefully we, we can work with people with that. Fantastic. Um, so what I think we might do now, Ilan, is, is go into the informal part of the this session, which I always think is the best part, actually, not, not to say that the presentation is not wonderful, but it's it's nice to actually get everyone um, who wants to stay on now. So first, I want to thank Renee and Alana again very much for their wonderful participation and, and presentation, but also, and we can um, now, I think, get everyone on the screen. We welcome you to our webinar next Wednesday and our subsequent webinars and events, and thank you all for your participation, and please, um, sign up and support us in any way you can. We are a charity, so we rely heavily on donations. Um, and they are fully tax deductible as well.